it's uh, been a very interesting ride since the election in November and uh, since uh, January. Uh, an election filled with vitriol uh, and uh, bickering, um, and it looked like we were headed directly for that in the immediate aftermath of the election uh, until the shocking tragedy in Tucson uh, jolted people back to a different uh, sense of reality, and that was followed, of course, by that quite remarkable scene at the State of the Union uh, where for the first time, instead of having Democrats all sit on one side of the uh, chamber and the Republicans on the other, they mixed together, uh, sitting amongst themselves, uh, strange uh, seat fellows everywhere. You could feel the sexual tension. Uh, <laughs> and then a debate uh, in the House over repeal of uh, the Affordable Care Act, the health care reform bill, that was a dramatic contrast with what we'd seen a year before when that bill was passed in the House. Uh, this time, uh, although, of course, it was a, uh, uh, quite an assault on an existing law uh, and a division right along party lines, but the discussion was, for the most part, done in a calm fashion, focused on policy. Even when you had uh, charges uh, put out there that were controversial, uh, for example, Mike Pence taking to the floor to say that this was a government takeover of health care, this time, it was going through the provisions of the bill and explaining why, in his view, that meant a government takeover of health care. Last time, it was death panels and you're trying to kill people and uh, 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 members having to run the gauntlet as they went into the chamber of uh, people shouting epithets at them and spitting on them and death threats and the like. A very real contrast. But to anybody who's been around this town for a while and knew what lay ahead, we knew it was faux bipartisanship. Uh, this was something that wasn't going to last for very long. And we're back at least to confrontation with some dancing around and a hope on the part of some of the leaders that perhaps they can find a way to get together to deal with uh, the bigger budget headaches and other problems that we have ahead. But it's going to be uh, very hard to do. And you could actually see it uh, shortly after the State of the Union uh, when uh, President Hu uh, visited from uh, China and uh, Fox News said it was a historic uh, uh, gathering of the mo world's most powerful communist uh, and the president of China. Uh, <laughs> that's more typical for our uh, dialogue uh, and rhetoric uh, now. And uh, obviously, it's playing out in a couple of ways. One is the continuing effort to repeal uh, the uh, uh, health care plan, uh, popularly known among Republicans as Obamacare, um, which is taking place at many levels, including not just in Congress, but in the courts. And uh, you can see where the political process has gone uh, when you know, as we've had uh, actually, almost a dozen judges who've ruled on this, many have just dismissed the case and others have either upheld the law uh, or uh, said that a small part of it or a significant part of it was unconstitutional, but the rest could go forward. Another saying you need to scrap the whole thing. Uh, but there's one very easy way to figure out what judges are going to do, and it has a, a perfect batting average, and that is which president appointed the judge. And uh, that tells you uh, all you need to know about our politics and to know that if and when this case reaches the Supreme Court, it is very, very likely to be a five to four decision, whichever way uh, it goes. A period of very, very close party divisions, but an increasing level of ideological and partisan uh, division, a gulf between the two parties. And one where uh, in the uh, uh, rankings uh, done by National Journal, uh, of uh, voting records from the last Congress, for the first time ever in the Senate, the most uh, liberal Republican was to the right of the most conservative Democrat. There was no overlap in the Senate between the two parties last year. And in the House, you had nine Democrats, most of them gone, who were just a little bit to the right of the most liberal Republican, Mike Castle of Delaware, also now gone. So we no longer have a center in Congress. We have a party here and a party here, and very few members left. There's still some uh, blue dog Democrats in the House, 
uh, but they're irrelevant now uh, in a, a chamber where the votes are along party lines and the Republicans uh, have the majority uh, now for almost everything. Uh, and we know that beyond the health care issue, which is going to play out through the budget process and the appropriations process, through the investigative process, um, that we now have this showdown over uh, spending and uh, focus right now on the continuing resolution for the current year's budget, uh, a continuing resolution that was deliberately kept short, you know, under, unlike the normal practice. Of course, last year wasn't normal in another way. We didn't get a single appropriations bill enacted into law. Uh, but instead of saying, let's punt until uh, we hit uh, the difficult choices in April, May, uh, and June over next year's uh, appropriations, they kept it short so that we could have a quick confrontation uh, over spending now. Now that confrontation uh, was barely averted, as you saw and know last week, um, with a two-week extension uh, with a $4 billion cut. But we have a sizable gulf between the Democrats in the Senate and the Republicans in the House over what to do on this issue. As Republicans want to follow through with a pledge that they made uh, in what's now become uh, common in our elections when a party is trying to take back the majority, they come up with a contract or a pledge or some kind of a proposal. We've gone from the contract with America uh, under Newt Gingrich to the 6 in 06 pledge by the Democrats under uh, Nancy Pelosi trying to come back in 2006 to the pledge to America last time. And that pledge included a specific we will cut $100 billion from the budget in the next year. And when the Republicans came back into power, the leaders said, well, you know, we can't exactly follow that pledge because we didn't realize when we did this that the fiscal year actually began October 1. And here it is January, and, you know, we're just getting started, so we got to prorate it. And so you know, it's going to be a little tough. We're going to do $40 billion. And, of course, it was actually a cut not from the real amount, but from the uh, budget proposal that President Obama had made a previous year that nobody had uh, paid any attention to anyhow. And that $40 billion put forward by the most respected House member uh, among uh, his Republican colleagues, Paul Ryan, um, and sh uh, shows us how the dynamic is working now, was uh, immediately shot down by the new members. Uh, 87 freshmen, a third of the entire Republican caucus knew this year, uh, saying 40 is not enough. And they were forced to go back and make it $60 billion for the remainder of the year, which fit the $100 billion pledge. And they had to slap together a bunch of cuts uh, to make that work. And it made it clear. Uh, as it included a, a series of other votes on the House floor where Speaker Boehner uh, was forced to uh, regroup after losing some battles, that maintaining control over his own members and the junior members is not going to be an easy task. This new class of 87, half of whom have never served in office before, half of the remainder uh, were gadflies in their own state legislatures. Their role model uh, is not uh, the speaker, but Senator Jim DeMint of uh, South Carolina. I call them Junior DeMints. Uh, <laughs> and they don't trust leaders of any sort, including in their own party. And you could see that uh, the incoming speaker actually knew that he had a problem the day after the election, when he knew that he was going to achieve his lifetime goal of becoming Speaker of the House. Excuse me for a minute, I'm choking up here uh, a little bit. Uh, the Speaker designate said to his new members, you know, we're going to have to be grown-ups here. And there are going to be times when we're all going to have to, ca have to cast votes that are going to be really tough and we don't want to do it. For example, increasing the debt limit. Uh, but it became clear that those words were not going to be uh, viewed with equanimity by the new members 
many of whom had pledged during the election campaign that they were going to cut spending come hell or high water, and if that meant uh, breaching the debt limit, well, so be it. And Speaker Boehner wasn't helped any by another reality, which is that even as he's trying to govern, or at least help govern with a piece of the action that Republicans now have in the House, he had to cope with a presidential campaign ahead with a large group of candidates whose goal is not to help uh, John Boehner govern, but to win a nomination. And most of them are stampeding over to a tiny strip of territory in the bedrock right of their own party. So even as he was trying to say to his members, we got to be grown-ups here, uh, Tim Pawlenty of Minnesota, for example, was saying, debt limit, bring it on. After all, worst thing that happens is we'll keep paying our creditors because tax revenue will come in. We'll just stop government, period. As if that wouldn't have any implications for the credit markets, the international economy, or anything else. Uh, but when you're trying to win over delegates uh, or get uh, a little traction in the presidential contest, that takes priority. And all of that makes it difficult to figure out how you're going to govern. Now, it becomes difficult as well because a focus, and I think a really foolish focus, on cutting $100 billion from discretionary spending, and in the end, cutting almost all of it from non-security discretionary domestic spending, and in the end, trying to cut that from one half of the year, meant you were focusing on cutting one half of one eighth of the budget. And so you're taking uh, a lot of flesh and muscle and bone out of a tiny share of the budget for what in a $3.8 trillion budget is actually a trivial amount that doesn't do much more than squat about actually solving your significant deficit and debt problems. But what it does do is make actually governing an almost impossible task. Uh, if you really look at it, take the $61 billion, that trivial amount out of $3.8 trillion. But since the discretionary domestic budget uh, is about $480 billion, roughly, and half of the year is $240 billion, you're talking about a 25% cut if you do it across the board, 20 to 25%. And of course, you're not going to do it across the board. And frankly, you can't do it across the board. If you were going to do it across the board, you'd have to cut FBI agents, because the FBI budget is about 96% personnel. Well, as you all know, you can't just fire people.